Hey everyone, Vancouver Radio, episode number 271, I believe that is correct. Um, so, an evolving theme in the show, uh, Rachel kind of moved on as a guest and Tom got more involved in the show as a co-host and we try to kind of evolve a little bit more of a kind of science focused theme. That's not to bombard you with papers or anything ridiculous, but it's to start to look more specifically at certain areas of health and fitness and really peel back the layers on certain topics rather than looking broader. And today's show is just that. Um, This man is very well experienced in the science, lives and breathes it every day with his own body, writes about it extensively, talks about it extensively online, has a very popular blog. Uh, Menno Henselmans, hello. Nice to be on the show. Now, when we did a sound check before, uh, you said your name far more smoothly um, than I did in your native tongue. Um, so perhaps, you can you just say your name so people can get a full flavour of how you actually pronounce your name? Right, Menno Henselmans. I'm Dutch originally, but now I'm a digital nomad, as they call it, so I'm, I go wherever. Wherever, choosing your own rules. Is your work uh, all online now? It's just wherever yeah I, I do some in-person consultations but it's mostly private stuff people that find out oh you're in Vietnam now uh, I live there let's do a consultation uh, everything I do basically the coaching my PT course it's fully online awesome dude Mal. Um, okay so let's give some background there'll be a huge proportion of the show that won't know who you are some people that have exposure Give me a little background. I know your background is a little bit different um, than than most. You have a background in business and kind of um, sort of analysis, and I think that's where your kind of passion for science has come from. Uh, so give people the story and add some good context to it. Sure, yeah, indeed. My background is very different than that of most people in the industry. Um, I started off working as a business consultant in the corporate sector, very much uh, company car, laptop, going to big companies, you know different stuff than fitness, I found out that wasn't my passion at all. It wasn't, you know, it was a good job in every respect. It was fine. It was prestigious, but it was more what probably my dad wanted for me than I really wanted in life. So fitness had always been my passion. And I started working on that more. I wrote an article for T-Nation, mostly because people kept telling me, you know, you should write about this, put your views on paper. And that resulted in my first publication and then got an audience, got started the website, uh, founded the Bayesian Body Building Method piece by piece. Or at some point that became the Bayesian PT course, you know, the whole method came apart into a certification program. And now we have a whole research team behind it. We're doing um, scientific work ourselves. We have a few papers uh, in print this year. It uh, should be a good year, this and the next one in terms of publications. So uh, it's actually a big company now. Uh, we try to do a lot of uh, cool stuff for the industry, and we're a lot more active on social media. Everything's going great, and I haven't regretted making that uh, career change a second in my life. Oh, awesome! So uh, I'm intrigued. The papers that you are sort of doing yourself this year, what what are they around? Is it a particular topic or a couple? Mm-hmm. It's a couple topics. So. Uh, one paper that was recently published, I co-authored a meta-analysis on protein intake, how much protein do you need. A uh, short version, we found no benefits above 1.6 gram per kilogram of total body weight, um, which for the guys that use pounds is 0.82 gram per pound, basically. And um, that was one thing that collaborated with a lot of uh, very great people in the industry. Uh, our own research team is more involved uh, right now with a study on the deadlift, whether um, you can predict based on your bodily dimensions, like if you have long arms, that kind of stuff, whether you're better for sumo or conventional. So that's one paper we're working on. We got one paper finished about the effect of going very high in protein, if that can uh, speed up recovery from strength training. So basically another addition to how much protein you need. Um, we published a, a review paper earlier on uh, metabolic damage. If it's a real thing, can you damage your metabolism? Short version, it's not. Uh, your metabolism adapts, but you do, do have to go really, really crazy if you want to do any kind of serious long-term damage that stays there when you regain uh, the weight. 
So yes, your metabolism adapts when you lose weight, especially if you lose lean body mass, but it goes back up when you regain the fat slash lean body mass. So it's an adaptation, it's not really damage. Okay, so I'm intrigued. So you will probably get a lot of people on Twitter or all over the place that kind of you know message you and say, uh, Menno, I think I've got you know metabolic damage. I've yo-yo dieted before. What's kind of like your approach? Because obviously in social media you've got to be quite succinct, right? And in that mm-hmm. environment you almost want to you know give them a good five ten minutes of your time and really explain the dynamics. How do you be quite short and to the point and try and share a view so that they feel empowered to go away and make the right kind of action? Mm-hmm. The, the short version there is basically don't worry about it, just get lean and then increase your energy intake and start bulking. You don't have to worry about doing any kind of long-term damage, just get into the body fat percentage that you're comfortable with, that's most important, and then start tuning up the calories a little. You don't have to worry about you know going up and down for the diet, it can be very linear. Okay, all right, uh, that would be my response. Um, I think, so in terms of, so that then leads to the question of reverse dieting, which is something that you have talked about quite a bit. And really, seeing as we've just talked about aggressive dieting, it leads into reverse dieting. Are you, so some old school thoughts were, we need to go really slowly, like 100, 200 calories per week, like ramp it up. Mm. Or are you kind of, let's make a big jump and then let's make some smaller jumps and then let's really kind of ramp up your training and find where your maintenance is again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we can go even uh, back even further if uh, really old school was uh, post contest binge followed by dreamer bulk. And um, you know, competitors they got really low on calories and crash dieted because of the idea that you know 12 weeks is contest prep with modern competition standards, usually it's more like double that. And afterwards, uh, people were very deprived, they didn't really have a plan, so they cranked up calories and they thought. You know, before I started this contest prep, my maintenance energy was, say, 3,000 calories. And then afterwards, they think, okay, so I go back to 3,000 or 3,100 even if I want to bulk. But they didn't take into account that right now they have a lot lower body mass, a lower body fat percentage and a lot lower uh, even lean body mass generally because most people lose some muscle mass during contest prep, at least if they're natural. And... Uh, that means they now have a lower maintenance energy intake. So they don't, they shouldn't go up to 3,000. You can bump up generally energy intake by 15%. 10% is very safe generally after contest prep. And you don't have to do it in the, you know, the the true reverse dieting as that started. Like you said, like maybe 100 calories. I've seen even uh, slower phases where they literally reverse the diet. So if you have a 12 week diet then you literally reverse that and spend 12 weeks working back up to maintenance. That is definitely overkill because normally if you're in, say, uh, a 10%, 5% deficit at the end of contest prep and you increase energy intake by 50 calories, you're still in a deficit. I mean, you don't want to stay in a deficit when you're already in contest shape, unless you have another show, of course. That is just needless self-torture. And it evolved as a response to the, you know, the post-contest binge, but they went a bit overboard. And as history usually goes, we go from one extreme to the other before we find the way in the middle that's probably optimal. And I suppose, really, the the point of contention here is, you know, you're a man of science and you've looked extensively at this. And really, the the problem here is a lack of education or an assumption by coaches. And we've had a lot of poor coaching over the years where coaches have said, oh, well, it makes sense to just reverse this and kind of, you know, do it like this without really investing in the science and thinking a little bit more kind of abstract. And that's when we've had really, I'm going to say 10, 15 years of a lot of people giving themselves a lot of needless harm, both physically and emotionally, by going through these really painful dieting phases. Yeah. So I agree with that 100%. I think in general because when you are doing things the bro way, basically, you're going by anecdotes, by he said, she said, or look at that guy, he's doing this, then you can see what works, you can see what doesn't work, 
but you have very little ability to optimize things. So you can see, okay, the, the people that you know, go way up in calories after a contest, they get fat pretty quick. And you see that people on a reverse diet, they stay ripped as hell. So it seems like that may be better. But you have very little uh, measure to quantify how much to increase energy intake by. An anecdote, it won't um, help you determine that precisely. And that's where the science comes in. We can actually quantify, hey, probably a 10, 15% increase in energy intake is the sweet spot. And then you can keep bumping it up from there to stay in a low energy surplus. I'll tell you what I'm intrigued by. We're, we're kind of discussing dieting from a scientific approach now. We know that dieting, contest prep, it is a very scientific process, but there's some things that potentially we don't know yet fully how it is explained by science, and this is how we have to apply coaching practice, intuition, and experience. I'm really intrigued as to what you're currently thinking as a practitioner that you want to explore with dieting that isn't currently in the research and that you are kind of like really eager to know or see proven in the science as a result of your coaching practice? Uh, one area that is remarkably understudied is a long-term effect of the amount of fats and carbohydrates in the diet on muscle growth and strength gains. There is actually very, very little literature, just studies looking at what happens we put these guys on a high carb diet, these guys on a high fat diet, same protein intake, same energy intake. Let's see what happens over the course of 12 weeks. You'd, you'd expect, you know, that's there, but every study is about protein. There's even not that much research on energy intake. So, you know, the, the whole carbs versus fat, there's a lot of research on sedentary individuals that are in energy deficit, but there is almost no research on strength training individuals in energy surplus that want to build muscle mass. So I think that is very, that would be very, very interesting, but it's hard as hell. You have to get a lot of people to follow a strict diet for 12 weeks, measure everything meticulously, make sure that they adhere to the right carbohydrate to fat ratio, and you have to randomize it. So you have all these guys that say, I wanna do keto, but the randomization says they have to go high carb, and they're like, screw this. So they don't, they deviate from the diet and your study fails. It's really, really hard to get people to um, stick to a study protocol. So I'm intrigued, why do you want to know that and what, what assumptions are you making currently as a coach? Right, uh, I, want to know to, I want to know everything about muscle growth and strength gains basically. Uh, that's why I want to know, uh, also for myself, for my clients, to optimize things. I think that currently there is a bit of a dogma that is influenced by uh, steroid use and the research on endurance training research that makes a lot of bodybuilders go really high carb and ignore uh, fat intake. And especially in women, we have some research indicating that women respond better to higher fat diets for uh, not just muscle growth and hormonal health, but also satiety, interestingly. And women tend to do better on ketogenic diets. They don't have the keto flu as much in my experience. And um, that may have important benefits for muscle growth. And we know that for some fatty acids, like omega-free fatty acids, it's one of the few we have a lot of research on. This can actually boost muscle growth. But I recently wrote an article, for example, on cholesterol. There's actually quite a few studies on that. It's all pretty shady stuff because a lot of it isn't published. And there's one author that uh, published most of it, and he has some funding from the ag industry and stuff. But it's all pointing in the same direction. It looks very legit, and that seems to suggest that cholesterol is actually very uh, important for muscle growth, which theoretically makes sense. You need it for muscle cell membranes. You need it for optimal hormone production to make enough testosterone. So uh, I think that's something almost nobody pays attention to. So that would be very interesting to study. Um, with the cholesterol and hormonal function, are you making that correlation just in men because of the link with testosterone? Or do you think there's a link with females as well? Yeah, I think so. Uh, actually, there, interestingly, uh, there is some research, uh, including a pretty recent paper in athletes, that finds uh, testosterone may be more effective, like a, a given increase in testosterone may be more effective in women than in men. 
And uh, that makes sense because women have 10 to 20 times less testosterone in total than men. But contrary to popular belief, also wrote a detailed article on this, women have the same muscular potential as men relative to their starting lean body mass. So it seems that they basically, their bodies can make do more with a given amount of testosterone. And anecdotally in my clients, if I look at the effects of, because uh, I also work with um, women and men that use anabolic androgenic steroids. I think that is a decision that people should make on their own. Um, so I allow it in some of my clients. It's a small minority, but it's very interesting there, I think, from um, a coach's perspective, because you can see things like women get a lot more mileage out of a very low dosage of anabolics compared to men, a dosage that in men would just be ridiculed as complete waste of time. Women make excellent progression on it. And that suggests that indeed women can do um, get more mileage out of a given amount of androgen or anabolics. That would be interesting and uh, it suggests that women may actually benefit more than men even from higher cholesterol intakes in their diet. Interesting. So this kind of segues a little bit into talking about fats a little bit more because um, doing a little bit more research around your work, ketogenic uh, approaches to dieting seems to be uh, an area of interest for you. Um, so I'm sure. actually going to like throw an open-ended question at you and say, where are you at with ketogenic dieting? What do you think the science tells us? And for me, where is its application in body composition, individuals, so physique sports, and where is it in relation to normal population, and I'm gonna I'm gonna describe myself as normal population with a slant to physique. I play rugby. I'm in the gym mm. a couple of times a week. I want to look good naked, but I also have to perform on the field, and I like to live a sociable life where I have a couple of beers. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, then a ketogenic, ketogenic diet is probably not for you. A ketogenic diet is suitable for two kinds of people, two kinds of activities, maybe. Uh, Long-term endurance sports, where the body can rely on fatty acids or ketones extensively for um, as fuel to fuel the exercise. And uh, resistance training or very high intensity training that is too short to induce a very high demand for glucose or uh, glycogen. If you get into the in-between area where you're sort of into uh, speed endurance, high intensity endurance, interval training, that kind of stuff, then generally the requirements for carbohydrate are simply too high to sustain maximal performance over time on a ketogenic diet. So rugby, probably a no-go. That said, there is some interesting research that things like um, elite gymnasts, taekwondo players, even training hours a day can do just fine on a ketogenic diet. In general, I think Ketogenic diets are highly underrated. I'm a bit in the middle here, um, as some people posit me as the keto guy and they think all my clients are on a ketogenic diet. I think I have about as many people on a ketogenic diet as I have on steroids, which is to say a small minority of the clients. Um, some people r absolutely love ketogenic diets. A lot of people hate them. Uh, I think that is unfairly so for a lot of people. They simply have not tried it themselves, at least given it a proper try for at least two weeks. Um, but I think it has, it's a valuable tool for bodybuilding. In contrast to uh, what most people think, once you're keto adapted, it seems that most people have no detrimental, uh, detrimental effects on their performance when they're in ketosis. And especially if you're doing a targeted ketogenic diet where you up the carbs a bit at 5 to 10 grams pre-workout and post-workout to um, supply glucose for the exercise and help replenish glycogen stores thereafter. Just a small bit is all that's needed generally. You find no um, decrease in repetition performance once you're keto adapted. So I think um, given the benefit, potential benefits of a high fat diet, and uh, you make sure the protein's high enough. Another mistake is that some people think keto means you have to go low in protein. Definitely never sacrifice protein for keto. Protein is more important. Um, with that in place, you have a proper ketogenic diet, and that doesn't mean eggs and bacon. It means you also consume veggies, you have a fiber intake, uh, you get enough magnesium, minerals, everything. 
then it is a very valuable tool and a lot of people can get a very great uh, appetite suppressive effect from it. So I particularly like it for certain individuals that have a very large appetite, have uh, trouble limiting energy intake, and some of them feel great on a ketogenic diet and they also experience huge appetite suppression. In research on general, it even it's even the case that people afterwards, once they've lost a lot of fat on the ketogenic diet, their appetite is still lower than before the diet. It's not for everyone. Like in my experience, I think the research is kind of lacking here and we don't have the research that shows, you know, this works for these guys, but not these guys. And that's definitely something that I see in my clients. Like some people, they actually notice they perform better at work. Colleagues comment on them, um, performing better, they're more clear, uh, sleep better. Whereas other people, they have an enormous keto flu, that's generally one indication, they may not respond well to it. And then afterwards, even once they keto adapt over the couple next couple days, week or two, they still feel kind of mad. Some they have, um, some for example, experience what I call zombie mode, and that they have no appetite, but they also have no more drive for, well, anything. So they're just completely lethargic and uh, not the nicest way to live. If you want to have a sociable life, have fun, then, you know, it's it's something that only works for some of our content prep. So I think overall, ketogenic diet, very underrated, wrongfully demonized, a valuable tool to have in your toolbox as a coach, not for everyone. I The reason why I find this interesting is because and this comes back to the interpretation or the willingness to interpret science is mm -hmm. a lot of people have been taking this thought process around hit based training and ketogenic dieting and taking kind of like this old school assumptive approach to hit where they're like on the treadmill for 30 seconds on the, the treadmill on the treadmill all that kind of stuff and then they're applying that to a ketogenic diet and you've just rightly highlighted that's not really hit based training. That's putting a lot of stress on the gly glycolytic energy system. Mm -hmm. If we scale that back and look at it in a still a high intensive way, but far less volume, then we start to see the benefit. And this for me, from what I've read, is where we see elite sports using high fat diets to get greater adaptation in athletic gains by putting people in very certain physiological states yeah definitely i think those are the areas like power lifters weight lifters they can benefit from it um ultra endurance athletes but the in between not so much one interesting application is that during ketogenic diet which is very relevant for people that have to make weight including power lifters and weight lifters you lose a lot of body water when you go on a ketogenic diet like a muscular man can easily lose about two kilos and it's mostly water some of it glycogen glycogen attracts water so you lose even more water and you look very lean very defined which is why a lot of people think it's better for fat loss but mostly it's just water loss and uh, that means you can basically without losing any muscle cut two kilos on your weight by going keto in the say the two weeks before your contest which means you can have two more kilos of muscle mass carrying uh, into the show Okay, so we've identified a couple of populations that this might be relevant to. You've used the general term of benefits. So let's say me, I stop playing rugby, I now focus on the gym three, four, five days a week. All I'm going to focus on is strength and my physique. You've told me, Ben, there's benefits to the ketogenic diet. What are these benefits that I might look to experience by a properly applied ketogenic diet yeah in terms of strength and muscle growth highly doubtful if you're going to get better results with keto than non-keto there are some studies pointing in this direction but um, other than a recent trial by um, Jake Wilson and colleagues there's nothing really convincing and that study has raised a lot of doubts including two letters to the editors from uh, myself and various other authors, that that study may not be very legit. The data doesn't look right. Um, the authors are affiliated with, um, and they now also have a book actually coming out on ketogenic dieting. They're affiliated with, I think it's 
prove it or well some company that sells ketones yeah, yeah. Mm. so uh, shady stuff there uh, I think the main benefits are mostly mental if you respond very well to it mentally that is a benefit appetite suppression is for many people a benefit in terms of actually muscle growth strength gains I doubt you're gonna gain more of that okay you have uh, I was a little I, to start with I was a little bit scared of your answer um, and the reason why I try and tactfully kind of go about my questions is at no point do I want anyone listening to this show to grab hold of a concept and misinterpret its application of the concept. And mm -hmm. getting to the bottom of that was really important for me because my experience with ketogenic dieting is I did it when I stopped playing rugby for a year. And I agree with you. Appetite suppression is is great. It was very similar to um, practicing intermittent fasting, which I've done on and off. And I, again, I really value as a tool as well. Um, but most people will say your mental clarity is, uh, is fantastic. And for me, all I say to people is think about it. Your body is now operating on a set amount of glucose every day. And you're putting it into a position where it can so tightly regulate its blood sugar level because it's no longer getting 50 grams here, 150 grams there, a beer there, ice cream there. And that allows blood sugar level to be absolutely bang on, regardless of what's happening with ketones um, and any other factors that play into mental cognition. That mm -hmm. alone is going to give you great stability. Yeah, and a lot of people, well, right, research hasn't confirmed if it's blood glucose or something else but a lot of people do experience that they are more stable mentally like their mood their appetite is more stable across the day they don't have the big ups and downs that you have with higher carb intakes so i'm intrigued what does your diet look like it varies a lot from time to time right right now i'm experimenting with some more extreme fasting protocols to see if that has any benefits uh, in part because uh, Mike, Matthew, Mike Matthew sent yep. me a whole bunch of his stuff. Um, actually got it right here. It's like, uh, as if you him buying in a bunch of stuff. Yep. And um, uh, wants me to see because I'm on his advisory board now. Uh, not affiliated, Not don't receive any kind of uh, financial compensation for supplement sales, anything like that. Purely the scientific advisory function. But I want to know, not just from the science, but also from a practical point of view, how it works and how it Faster training, um, how you respond to that. I'm not a fan of faster training from a scientific point of view, but practically, uh, I kind of like it for myself personally. Uh, I don't think I'm going to stick to it long term. So now I have a very long fast, uh, trained fasted just with uh, this supplement, which, uh, funny enough, contains HMB, which is also um, uh, very shady. Uh, in terms of scientific support, like one study showing greater gains than steroids even. And um, most research not finding any benefits really. So uh, it has your imbine and HMB stuff that I'm not really a fan of, but it's great for appetite suppression at least, and it gets me through the workout. And then I have a very big meal, and I basically only have two meals, so I work out at like four, large meal, another large meal before I go to bed at around 12, and then a very long fast. Not my general diet. I'm generally more of a three to four meals um, per day guy, more balanced approach. But um, I like experimenting with things. And this has worked better than I thought so far. Okay. And when you say it's worked better, has it just fit around your lifestyle? Is a particular outcome that you're looking for from applying this diet? Um, mainly just the experience. See what it's like. Um, I had never actually tried completely fasted training before, like at least not uh, regularly, intentionally for a period of time. And um, you know, I'm not a fan of it. I do not recommend it to clients. So I think, well, I should at least try it. You know, because some clients that tell me uh, actually like it, I don't have the time to prepare a meal beforehand. Uh, I feel better when I work out fasted. So I want to know uh, what it's like. And. It does fit my schedule really well. Uh, now we're in Portugal, and they have a lot of really awesome all-you-can-eat sushi places, which is my favorite food in the world. Mm -hmm. And I can fit that in quite well um, if I have only two meals. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I have four meals a day and one of them is all-you-can-eat sushi, I'm going to overeat for sure. So I have a pretty lenient, especially now with my energy expenditure. Somebody crashed my car, 
So I have a, I ride a bicycle now over the Portuguese hills, energy expenditure, activity levels through the roof now. And uh, which means I have like close to 5,000 calories a day to spare. Um, so I can eat lots of sushi and that really fits my lifestyle right now. Interesting. Um, I've always said if I stopped playing rugby, I would probably go back to practicing intermittent fasting because again, it fits my lifestyle. I, I'm a mm. morning person. I like to be able to just get up and do and do my job. And if I could wake up at five in the morning and work till midday without eating, that is literally seven hours. I haven't got to think about food. All I've got to do is drink. And for yeah, me, the, the productivity there is just colossal. Mm. Right. And that means a lot to me. And for a lot of people that work a seven-hour day, that's like, that's your work day done, potentially. Yeah, same here. I'm most productive in the morning. I used to be a typical night owl person, had insomnia in college. Uh, completely reversed that by carefully controlling my biorhythm. Uh, now I have a very regular sleep schedule. I work up, I'm most productive. Um, actually, I'm writing a book on that. And it's funny because there's a lot of research indicating that in a large survey, uh, Danish researchers, Scandinavian researchers have um, looked at this and it, seen, and it turns out that almost all highly intellectual jobs have people that do most of their creative and most intellectually demanding work in the mornings. And that makes sense from uh, a cognitive point of view. If you look at your biorhythm and you look at studies that uh, assess uh, cognitive functioning in terms of not really reaction speed, but um, visual tasks, for example, like being able to spot things on a screen, um, other tests of how you, well your brain functions, how quick it uh, makes connections and registers information. It's generally best in the morning and basically goes on a, a slow decline throughout the whole day and just before you go to bed, it hits rock bottom and then you sleep. So that's interesting. There's uh, multiple lines there to support that uh, intellectually demanding work is best done in the mornings if you have a good sleep schedule and later in the day um, it's actually a better time for your workouts if you have the freedom to plan your workout whenever you want to mm. i'm exactly the same up at five or six work and then i'm like off and then around three four p.m train you got more time you feel like you know you've done your day's work and you've kind of got it in the bag but you're mm. not training so late that you kind of feel tired from the day, like trying to train at six, seven o'clock, I'm never mm -hmm. as good as if I train at three or four. And if I want to get the most out of my workouts, then I'm diligent about planning the earlier part of my day to get the most out of my body. Yeah, plus you avoid rush hour at the gym. Yeah, which is shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Menno, uh, before we kind of wrap up, I um, want to respect your time. Uh, thank you again for your time. Is there anything else that you kind of feel needs to be said to wrap up this conversation? Anything that you think I should have probed into to give clarity to the audience before we sort of say, this is where you can find Menno. See you later. No, I think um, you asked the right questions. I think we provided context where necessary. Um, I think we did a good job here. Just before we do go, um, I'm intrigued actually because you've talked about your diet and what you're currently doing. What is your current training plan? It sounds like it might be quite low volume, quite high strength based, based on what you told me with your mm -hmm. current diet protocol. It's rel relatively low volume. Max. I actually train with a very high frequency training approach generally, which is full body pretty much every day. Uh, I only recommend that for very advanced trainees that have everything in check, their nutrition, their sleep, everything. Um, as a disclaimer, before people start trying this. Um, but I'm now experimenting with um, half body, half body, yeah, basically two split every other day. And I'm trying to see if I can hit a 600 pound deadlift. So I'm doing a lot of deadlifting, which I normally don't uh, do a lot of, because I don't think it's a great bodybuilding exercise. Um, so I tailor my program around that. Now, upper body is um, actually quite a lot of uh, contrast to normal, quite a lot of machine work, cable work, because I have uh, elbow tendinosis, unfortunately, which limits my upper body workouts. And um, it's, wor it's working okay. Interesting, interesting. I say interesting because, A, uh, I've, I'm doing the exact same in my workouts. I'm doing upper, lower, upper, lower, upper, lower, and I find the mm -hmm. frequency really good for me to try and maximize building muscle. 
I stopped mm. deadlifting quite a while ago because I think it sucks for bodybuilding as well. I just, I've, I've don't get me wrong. I think mm-hmm. it helps build strength. It's a great strength exercise, but the amount of time it takes to warm up, perform, and and really progress within the gym, I'm like, I could have done mm. three other different types of exercise and really put a lot more volume through my muscles. Um, so yeah, uh, very interesting. And I also I can't straighten my right arm. So I kind of do a lot of similar things, like I do a lot of cable fly work instead of pressing and things like that. Weird. <laughs> hey, brother from another mother. <laughs> <laughs> um, Menno, um, you write fantastically. Your work is brilliant. Um, please tell the listeners where they can find you after today. Right. Uh, my main website is BayesianBodybuilding.com. Uh, MennoHensemans.com will also get you there. Uh, mainly active on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, all under the names Metal Hands Mons and Beijing Bodybuilding. You can find everything there. I have a newsletter you can subscribe to to get a notification when we publish a new article. Have a look, see if you're interested. Amazing. Um, for anyone that wants those links or is unsure about the spelling, go into the show notes of iTunes, just press I, you'll be able to see it. All the links will be there. Um, if you see this show via any of the social networks, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook, shout, you know, say something, interact with us, uh, tell uh, Menno what you thought of the show, show him some love, he's given his time today, and I think today has been really valuable to open up the conversation of personalizing your approach to your own training and nutrition to get the most out of your body, but also your life. Because there is life outside the gym. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. I think that is really important. If there's one take-home message that I always give, it's, you know, at least from I'm a hedonist philosophically, ultimately, all that matters is how happy you are in life. Everything you do in the gym, your nutrition, you do it to be happier in life. If it's not making you happier, you're doing it wrong. Amazing. Menno, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. Everyone, Please show some love for the show. Otherwise, I will see you all next week. Myself and Tom will be back with a Q&A based show where we'll be answering your questions and then I'll have a guest on the following week. Everyone, stay awesome. Hey everyone, Vancouver Radio, episode number 269.